Today we talk about little hitchhikers in your uterus, also known as uterine polyps. I'm Dr. Mark Amos, and this is Taco About Fertility Tuesday. Well, welcome back to another episode of Talk About Fertility Tuesday, where we dive into the science of fertility with a side of fun and, of course, a side of tacos. Today, we're going to unravel a topic that might not be talked about often, but is incredibly important to your health and fertility. These are uterine polyps. Uterine polyps are known as what are called endometrial polyps. They're small, benign growths that can grow in the lining of your uterus. Now, while they may sound insignificant, these little growths can have a big impact on your reproductive health, especially when you're trying to conceive. So whether you're curious about what causes these polyps, how they might affect your fertility, or just want to know the best ways to prevent them, to treat them, you're in the right place today. So what is a polyp? Well, a polyp is when the tissue in the uterus overgrows. So every month, the endometrial lining is going to get thicker and thicker waiting for a pregnancy. And if an embryo falls in there and implants, it stays there. If it doesn't, you shed and you have a menses. Now, sometimes this lining can overgrow and develop into these tissue called polyps. And polyps kind of look like skin tags. I usually will tell people, think of skin tags on the skin. These are skin tags in the uterus. Just like hitchhikers, they're not wanted. And just like hitchhikers, they can sometimes just go away. But other times, you really have to force them out. Now, when you're younger, polyps can cause issues like irregular bleeding, where you can get spotting between the periods, but they're rarely cancerous. Matter of fact, less than 1% of the time are they ever cancerous. After age 35, but before menopause, the risk for cancer of polyps is still low, maybe 1% to 2% at the most. But once you get the menopause, things start to change. Now there's about 5 to 10% chance if you have a polyp that it could be cancerous. So once you're in the menopausal stage, it's very important to have this evaluated. But when you're younger, especially under 35 or let's say in the reproductive age, do you really have to go remove it right away? And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about. But before we jump into how to remove them or whether you should remove them, let's talk about what causes them. The simplest explanation is going to be hormonal factors, specifically estrogen. Estrogen causes growth of the cells in the uterine lining, and so excessive estrogen can cause the cells to overgrow, causing polyps. We call it hyperplasia when it first grows excessively, and then when it makes an actual structure, like a piece of tissue in the polyp, we call it a polyp. Now keep in mind the exact mechanism that causes overgrowth is not completely understood. However, we do know things like hormonal imbalances, such as with estrogen, or age, or obesity, which again causes estrogen levels go up, high blood pressure, PCOS, again, having high estrogen levels, and even chronic inflammation or insulin resistance can cause uterine polyps. And this kind of makes sense because all these different things are associated with elevated estrogen levels or elevated inflammation. And with elevated inflammation, we see insulin resistance. So it's not always that these things directly cause the polyps, but that whatever milieu causes these things all have elevated estrogen. Because of this, almost any patient who has polycystic ovarian syndrome, I recommend getting a sonohistogram to look inside the uterus because their risk for polyps are higher than the general population. Now, if you want to get into the deep nerdy stuff, then you start looking at things like estrogen receptor signaling and that there might be an overexpression of the estrogen receptors. Specifically, there's what's called alpha and beta receptors. And potentially, if that ratio of the alpha is higher than the beta, that can sometimes cause growth of polyps. There's even concern that gene mutations can lead to these things or different pathways that cause elevation in estrogen. Then there's the question of even the cells dying. So all cells, as they grow, eventually undergo a process called apoptosis, in which then they disappear. And so there's this concern that these cells are not being killed under the normal program death that should occur with with apoptosis, that there might be an overexpression of B-cell 2 
And that can then cause increased survival of the cells, causing accumulation, which then cause polyps. And there's other things out there like looking at growth factors and inflammation issues. And again, things that cause elevation and insulin resistance. But if you're taking a very generic test, just say elevated estrogen. And so the things that cause elevated estrogen are things that are going to cause uterine polyps. I also tend to notice that people who don't shed their lining often also have a higher risk of uterine polyps. Now, I'm not talking about someone who has an IUD and that they're not having a period. I'm saying someone who has anovulation. So there's going to be a patient with PCOS, someone who's not having a period every month, they will have a higher risk of polyps because they're estrogen dominant. Their progesterone is not coming around often, and so the lining is undergoing that hyperplasia, which causes uterine polyps. So if you fall into one of these categories, such as having polycystic ovarian syndrome, not getting your period all the time, have elevated weight, or specifically central obesity, you probably have a higher risk of uterine polyps. Now, this doesn't mean you need to go run to your doctor and be tested, but it's important to at least keep that in mind. The thing you need to look at is, what are your symptoms? Do you have symptoms of a uterine polyp? Now, one symptom is infertility. If you're not getting pregnant, that could be a possible cause. Some of the more common symptoms in patients who have polyps in their uterus are going to be things like abnormal uterine bleeding. So this is going to usually be like an irregular menstrual period where it's very heavy and lasts longer. The other thing is going to be intramenstrual bleeding, where you actually get bleeding in between the periods. So this would be like getting a period one week, and then you expect a period in a month, and then halfway through you start bleeding again. That would be something consistent with a polyp. Another big one comparing periods is going to be painful periods. Sometimes when the body's trying to get rid of that uterine polyp, it can cause severe cramping. Any person who has infertility should undergo a sonohistogram or at least a hysteroscopy to evaluate for polyps because it can be a cause of infertility. And like I said, any woman with polycystic ovarian syndrome or who's not ovulating, I highly recommend doing a sonohistogram. If you have abnormal uterine bleeding, same thing. Always want to check a sonohistogram to evaluate your uterine cavity. So now that we determined who is at higher risk for uterine polyps, the question is, what do you do when you get them? And this depends on where you are in either reproduction or your age. If you're young and they're very small polyps and you're really not planning on trying to get pregnant currently, you can just watch them and make sure that they're not doing anything. And so your doctor just every year can evaluate them. And eventually they may even shrink or even get rid of on their own, where your body just kind of passes them with your period. Now you can only do this if it's asymptomatic, right? If your periods are horrible, why would you want to keep watching it? So you have to be asymptomatic and they got to be small. When they start getting bigger, they're rarely asymptomatic. Now, if you're trying to get pregnant, it's a little bit different. Even asymptomatic ones may be causing symptoms such as infertility. So if you're having problems getting pregnant and you find it, now small ones matter more. They didn't matter before, but now they matter more. Now the question is, when does it matter? There are some people out there that say it has to be greater than half a centimeter. Some even say a centimeter. I don't think anyone has that true definition because let's say, for example, you have one large one over a centimeter. Almost every fertility doctor is going to say, yeah, you should remove that. But what if you have like one small one that's three millimeters? Doesn't seem like that big of a deal. But what if there was 40 of them that are 0.3 centimeters? Now, all of a sudden, that's a lot of polyps. So what's the calculation? How do you know when you should remove them or not remove them. There's no nomogram that says, okay, if you have this many and this size and they add up to this volume, you should remove them. And so it's, it's always going to be a clinical decision. Never feel like your doctor made a wrong decision for not removing them because they're making a clinical decision because, again, there's no nomogram for this. But on the same token, you know, if you feel like you're not getting pregnant and someone doesn't want to remove them, there's nothing wrong also removing them. Now, one of the reasons people want to remove them is they're worried about cancer. But like I said, it's rarely about cancer. We check them all, but really the only patients under 35 or even in reproductive age that are going to have cancer are going to be people who either never get their period, have severe insulin resistance, or someone who is like a type 2 diabetic who has severe central obesity 
there's a higher risk in them, but again, still very low. Now, the gold standard for removing polyps is going to be surgery. And there's basically two surgeries you can do. There's what's called a DNC, where you just blindly go in there and scrape the inside of the uterus, or a hysteroscopy with polypectomy, where you go in with a camera, see the polyps, and then remove them. That's probably the best way to do it because you can make sure you get all the polyps. Whereas if you're doing it blindly with a DNC, you don't know if you're actually getting all the polyps. So you might end up doing the procedure and you didn't get them all. So that's why most people do hysteroscopic polypectomies now because you can be assured you got all the polyps. Anytime you remove tissue from the uterus, you always send it to a pathologist to be reviewed just to be sure it's not cancerous. But again, that's very unlikely. Usually it might, may come back with hyperplasia or tipia, but rarely does it come back with cancerous when it's just a polyp. Now, there are times when they're small, they can be shrunken with things like progesterone, giving someone Provera for a period of time, or even putting in a IUD that releases a little bit of progesterone. That progesterone environment can reduce some of that hyperplasia, and that can then sometimes reduce the risk of, of polyps, but also reduce them by going away. But like I said before, if you're doing fertility, you don't want to wait a year or two. I have one patient who actually did, and she didn't want to do surgery, and she just kept waiting and waiting, and it, it did go away, but it was at least a year until it went away on its own. So for most people, because they want to get pregnant now, they usually undergo the procedure to remove the polyps. When we're talking about IVF, then we really remove the polyps even sooner. And the reason why is because if you have a little polyp and you're trying on your own, when you're with your OB doctor, you, you might make the argument not to do surgery. But if you spent a lot of money doing IVF and you got this beautiful embryo, why would you want to put that embryo into your uterus when you know there's a polyp in there? There's a hitchhiker in there that you don't want. You don't want to put a polyp in there. You don't know what type of person that polyp is. It'd be a really horrible polyp. It's really going to be a good friend. So almost always when people are doing IVF, they remove those polyps. So then what could you do to prevent polyps? Well, if the most common thing that causes polyps is elevated estrogen levels, things that can reduce estrogen levels are going to be able to help you the most. So these are going to be things like maintaining a healthy weight. This is going to be things like managing conditions like polycystic ovarian syndrome, or even being on progesterone. So being on like a birth control or taking progesterone regularly to get your period. But anything that can reduce estrogen will help it the most. Now we talked about inflammation also affects it. So things like low-carb diets are going to help it. Additionally, there has been shown that high blood pressure can be associated with polyps, so keeping your blood pressure under control as well. Now keep in mind, as I mentioned before, these are associations. There's no causative agent. We don't even really understand 100% how these polyps form and what causes them. So there's associations we see, and we say, hey, those are associated with polyps. But again, it doesn't mean you're always going to prevent them by doing these things. But the downside for fertility patients is a lot of fertility patients will notice, they'll say, I never got polyps in my life. And then I start fertility treatment, and now I get polyps. Well, you are correct. The estrogen levels that you're getting through IVF, these high estrogens that you're taking when you're doing transfers, can cause polyp formation. So you are not incorrect. Unfortunately, doing fertility treatment also causes polyps, which polyps can cause problems with fertility. It is a double-edged sword. Overall, when talking about polyps, we talked about the most common cause is going to be estrogen. And estrogen can elevate for many reasons, as we talked about inflammation, obesity, and people not having periods can increase your risk of polyps. As we talked about, polyps rarely cause cancer, and only when you're menopausal do you really need to worry about that much. For most people, they don't know they have polyps, but if you do have a polyp and you're having irregular periods or even infertility, there is a good chance you have polyps. One of the things I talked about is, again, you can watch these, but for most people doing fertility treatment, you're going to remove them. And the most successful way of removing them is going to be surgery. As you can see, polyps are very important. They're annoying. They are little hitchhikers in your uterus that you don't want. If anything, we can maybe call them squatters because they really need permission to be in your uterus. And unfortunately, like I said, the treatment to get pregnant can also cause polyps. And polyps can cause you to have infertility. So it can be a vicious circle as you're trying to get pregnant, you could potentially be creating these polyps.
there's no question there are some people that are more prone to them. And that is because of the genetics they have that may increase those factors we talked about that cause increased estrogen levels and reception of those estrogen levels. And just remember, when you talk to your doctor, the decision of what to do is a clinical decision. There is no nomogram. No one knows exactly what's going to cause it, what size is going to be too big. So for that reason, you really have to just talk to your doctor and figure out the best plan for you. I hope you like this podcast. I hope it might be able to help someone. I'm sure a lot of people want to know what polyps are. I never learned about them until I became a doctor. So if you like this, please give us a five-star review on your favorite medium. Tell your friends about it. And most of all, keep coming back every week on Tuesday for Talk About Fertility Tuesday. <laughs>